Uh, thank you so much to all of you. Such a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And thank you so much to the Association of Christian Media for the invite today. I, I cannot tell you, just walking in here, seeing some familiar faces, my TBN family is here, um, and also meeting some new people. And I'm like, wow. The word is moving. The children of God in the kingdom of God are working. Um, I've had the opportunity of judging some of uh, the submissions for the awards for the ACM. So as you were introducing yourself and you're introducing your stations or your networks, I'm like, oh, I remember them. Oh, I remember they do this. So it's great to, you know, make it personal and to finally meet all of you. So truth and love in a changing world. I love it. I love what Graham said when he said, when you speak the truth with love, that is when you get true potency. That's when you actually are able to convey your message in the way that it needs to be conveyed. But perhaps let me start with a bit about myself and about this changing world and truth and love in a changing world. We all have experienced and seen how the world is changing and are grappling with how to best deal with the challenges that we faced. And as I contemplated the topic for this conference. I was taken back to way back in the day, I'm not gonna tell you how many decades ago, because I just might uh, give away the secret. Somebody saw me at a conference this past weekend and they say, wow, you haven't changed at all since generation days. And I said, yeah, it's the Jesus juice. That's what I consume, the Jesus juice kind of keeps you fresh. But contemplating this entire theme for this conference, it took me back to when I was a kid growing up. I grew up in Katlehong, which is a small township in the east of Johannesburg, in Ekorulen. Any of you know Katlehong? Yeah, some of you. All the cops are people probably like Katle what? <laughs> yeah. Katlehong, it's a small township, Ekoruleni, in the east of Johannesburg. And I have such fond memories of growing up because at home were my cousins, male and female, and we're all pretty much the same age. You know, Slandilana, all pretty much five, six, seven, eight, 12, 13, 14, but there were lots of us, especially during the holidays. I have no recollection of my aunts being there or my uncles being there, no recollection of them, but a recollection of us as the kids and everything that we used to get up to, and a recollection of my grandparents and my great grandmother. Now, our home, it was a tiny home, modest. Two bedrooms, um, a lounge, a kitchen, a dining room, but it was a home filled with laughter. It was a home filled with pranks. It was a home filled with love, filled with prayer, filled with singing, and filled with a lot, and I mean a lot of chores. Each and every single one of us had something to do, whether it's washing the curtains, washing the dishes, doing the laundry, cooking, and my particular chore most of the time, and I don't even know how I end up being the one getting that chore, was to to, um, what's to koropa in English? Mop, there you go. <laughs> There's you, 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 you feel me, ne? There's somebody who's like, yeah, the English just escapes you, and then it comes back. So my job was to mop the floor, but not really mop, because you know, when, I, when you talk of mop, you think of somebody standing there with a bucket and a mop, and you're actually mopping. No, 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 that's not how you do it. You pour water in a bucket, and then you've got the rag in there, and you've got to go on your knees. You're on your knees, wipe on, wipe off. Anybody watch The Karate Kid? Yeah, that's the Karate Kid, but that's the mild version, I'm telling you. Because mine had three stages. First, you've got to mop with your knees on the floor. You've got to wipe. You've got to put the polish on. You let the polish dry. And then you go back and you frave. <laughs> yeah, you frave that lacquer until it blocks them like this. You frave it until it shines like this. And you know you use a pantyhose. First you use the brush, right? And then you've got to use the pantyhose because the pantyhose is what gives it that glow. So I learned that skill of frafing. So there, that was my job. And I tell you, and I kid you not, that for the longest times, I'm not gonna show you my knees. I was almost tempted to. But my knees were so black. 
black, 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 just from the work, you know, black, black, black. And these are the marks that have been left from that era in my life. They faded over time, but, but you know, but I look at them with such fondness because they remind me of a time and a place and smells that I just don't have anymore, cooking and, and laughter that's not the same anymore because we're not those little children, we've grown, our laughter has changed, but it's still us. But these black knees remind me of what I would term the wonder years. Anybody watch the wonder years way back in the day? Reminds me of the wonder years. And I'm sure I can see a lot of you kind of like nodding because you are kind of connecting with your own childhood, your own wonder years, your own scars or whatever it is that they may be that remind you of a time gone by. It's marks like those, but perhaps even more importantly, the non-physical marks, the marks that have been left on my soul, that have been etched in my mind, that have been etched in my spirit, that have formed my thought patterns and formed my belief systems from a time gone by, but useful for the era of now. And one such is one of our drills that we used to do every single night is, we used to have to go out to the loose, the toilets were outside. Right? And there was another long stoop from the kitchen all the way to the end of the yard. And right at the end of the yard was the singular toilet. And two by two, we had to go out and use the loo every night. And it was dark, there was no light. So we'd go there and obviously you don't know who's lurking for you in the dark and we'd scare each other as kids and all sorts of things. But my great grandmother, the great patriarch or matriarch of our family, Umam Vondla, used to stand at the beginning of this long stoop right by the kitchen and she'd watch us go to the toilet, scared, holding hands, who's in the dark, what's lurking. She'd know that we were afraid and she'd stand there and say, Dianbon, Dianbon, Dianbon. That means, I see you. I see you. I see you. Calm, measured, bold, consistent. Dianbon, Dianbon, Dianbon. And that was enough to reassure us that we were not alone. It was enough to reassure us that yes, we are walking into the dark, but there's somebody that we know and we trust who says, I got you. You may not know where you're going, you may not know what lies ahead of you, but because I am here, you are okay. Dianbon, Dianbon, Dianbon. And in a changing world, where values are so quickly shifting, where things that were previously unacceptable are now not only acceptable, but are celebrated. Now, more than ever, we need that voice that will be a lamp unto our feet. A voice that will remind you of where you come from. A voice that will speak your truth to you, despite the fear of the moment, despite the uncertainty of the situation. That voice that is a lamp unto our feet. And for me in my life, I have found the word of God to be like the voice of Umam Vondla. The word of God as the lamp unto my feet. As I move forward into spaces and territories that I don't understand. Into spaces and territories that may be intimidating. Into spaces and territories that I know I've got to conquer and I know I've got to go into because that's where I have been sent. But Lord, I cannot go unless you go with me. I cannot open my mouth unless you sit on these lips. And so I need your word, my God, to be who Umam Vunda was to me and to say, I have held you on the palm of my hand. Go. You do not go alone. Dagbon. Dagbon. 
Jagbona. What is that voice for you? The voice of your mamvundla. The voice that God uses to say to you, I've got you. But more than assurance, it's to give you direction. More than assurance, it's to be your anchor, to remind you who you are and to remind you whose you are. In a world that has diminishing moral campus, no anchor, the word of God reminds us what we should be focusing on. It reminds us exactly what is the perfect will of God. Not what we think the world needs because what the world needs is forever changing. You'll remember that a while back it was illegal to smoke marijuana. It was illegal. You'd be locked up, you'd, be go, you'd go to jail. And I wonder how people who were locked up for smoking marijuana feel right now. Looks like a huge injustice. You were just at the wrong place at the wrong time, born in a different era. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and that sorry doesn't quite cut it because you know what? You had to pay the price. You had to pay the price for what people now are becoming multimillionaires and billionaires doing. In the comfort of your home now, you can smoke marijuana. It's not a crime. But it was then. So you see, the world changes and the laws of the world change. And what's acceptable now may not have been acceptable back then. So what then is our anchor? What then is the way that we should be going? The word of God not only reminds us of that, but it instills that inside of us. And so we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by obedience. And we find ourselves where many before us have found themselves. Those who lived in a generation of tumultuous change in the world. We are not the first to go through this, nor are we the last. But many have gone before us and have grappled with the same questions and the same issues that we are grappling with right now. Perhaps not the same in, 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 in the minute nature of the specifics, but definitely the same thematically, the same issues that we are dealing with now. In times of great change, it is that voice of God that we need to hear when we are making decisions about which jobs to take, which stories to cover, how to cover those stories. It is the voice of God, the word of God, the Bible that we need to consult when we make decisions about which schools we are going to take our children to, who we are going to marry, which businesses we are going to build, where we are going to invest our money. These are the pertinent life choices and decisions that we need to make. And it is the word of God that we really need to consult in order to make sure that we do not change along with the changing world, in a way that draws us away from our core, in a way that draws us away from the will of the Father, which is, I know, for each and every single one of us here, paramount in everything that we do. So, for decades, the media has been blamed for setting priorities. The media has been pointed to as the one that sets the thermometer as to what people ought to think and how people ought to react to the situations. But the truth is, the media is just a medium. The media is just a platform. It is the people behind the platforms, the people behind the mics, the people behind the newspapers, the people behind the TV stations, they are the ones that set the agenda. And we use the mediums to fulfill that agenda. So we cannot blame an inanimate being that has no power in itself except the power that is given to it by those who use it and utilize it. Everyone has an agenda and that is perfectly fine. We all need an agenda because we know that nature does not leave a vacuum. We're taught that in science. 
Either you influence or you will be influenced. Either you are chased or you will chase. But nothing is stationary. There is always movement. So the question that we have to ask is, are we being chased or are we chasing? Are we proactive or are we reactive as the body of Christ, as Christian media? Are we just reacting to what is happening in the world or are we setting the agenda? Sir, the two brothers there have got me. We are reacting because the world is fast changing. It always has been. But we are now trying to keep up with the changing world. But that is not what we ought to be doing. Actually, we need to be setting the agenda for a world that will continue to change. But as it changes, it needs to know where to go to find its center. It needs to know where its roots are. It needs to know where it can find its anchor when everything is everywhere and haphazard and everything goes. Because there will come a time and there will come a place where we all kumbule kaya. Where we all have to go back to basics where the truth of the fast life catches up with you, when you realize that all that glitters is actually not really all gold. So where do you go when that time comes? You can't prevent it from happening because it's life. It's life. There are many PKs, pastors, kids who grew up under the word, who suckled the word from their, from their mother's bosom and know nothing else except the word of God. But you let them out into school, you let them out into university, and the child comes back home and you don't even recognize them. Because this is not the daughter you raised, this is not the son you raised, but here they are. Here they are. Because yes, we are in the world, we are not of the world, but the world sure is real. The world sure is real and it will leave its mark on you. It may be your black knees. It may be your broken heart or your jaded mind. It may be unforgiveness and hatred, which when you look at it may be very justified because, you know, there's a lot of injustice in the world. But where do you go when you hit rock bottom? Where do you go when the truth of your reality is staring you in the face. There's got to be a place to run to. There's got to be something that never changes. There's got to be something that's so sure. Something that was the same yesterday, that is the same today, and will be the same forevermore. An unchanging God, an unchanging word of God is what we use as our anchor. And so media owners, media practitioners, recognize the power of your station, the power of your assignment, the power of your work. And when it gets hard between budgets and cuts, and resources, and all the realities and the challenges, remember why you are doing it. And remember that because of you, somebody somewhere will be saved. Because of you, somebody somewhere will be the morning after the night before listening to your radio station, and they will receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and say, this far and no more. I have had it Nizwile, enough. And so do not tire in doing good. Do not tire because you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Yes, you are. And with the drudge of day-to-day -day responsibility, sometimes it doesn't feel like that because it tends to be business as usual. But what is business as usual to you is an issue of life and death to those who need it. So may you keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on.
Social media has really taught us a lot. Power before used to lie in the hands of a few, but now it doesn't. Because, you know, everybody's got an opinion, everybody's got a voice, and they also now have a medium, a platform that they can use to communicate their own message. So everybody now can be a communicator. Everybody now can be an influencer. The only thing is issues of ethics, issues of integrity, issues of research, of verifying, all the things that you would do as a communicator and as a journalist and one who understands the weight of your responsibility, that is not done. That is not done because I feel like this. And so because I feel like this, I'm going to let you know how I feel. And you have to take it, deal with it. And so you find a lot of hurt people spewing a lot of hurt. A lot of damaged people further damaging others. Because that's just their way of healing right now. Because you know, there's a saying that hurt people hurt others. Because when you do that, it kind of makes you feel better about yourself. It's almost like whew, there's a load that has been released of your shoulders. But you release the load from your shoulders and, oh boy, do you put that load onto a multitude. Talk about a virus, right? Maybe that's why it's called going viral. Maybe. You just need a drop, just one, just one. And you can see, because in the news right now, an allegation is as good as that being, being found guilty. It's as good as a conviction. You literally don't have to go into a court of law to be guilty. An allegation is enough to set doubt, it's enough to set suspicion, and then the world runs with it. Social media runs with it. The next thing you are trending, the next thing you are resigning, the next thing you are not being hired for jobs, and you haven't even stepped into a court of law. How's that for justice? But yes, such is life in a changing world. Such is life in a changing world. But you can't blame anybody on social media for using the medium and as a platform because everybody has a story to tell and everybody wants their story to be heard. Jesus did exactly the same thing. He really did. The woman at the well, the Samaritan. Here she stood and before her was a man who told her her whole history. All the things that she thought were secret, hidden. No, no, no. Jesus kind of stripped her naked and said, girl, I see you. Dagborn. <laughs> Dagborn. Dagborn. Christ literally went into the very core of her and ripped out things that she was like ashamed of and thought, well, this is the stranger kind of talking about my business. But there's something that she got there. She got to offload and she had an encounter with the living waters. That when you drink from this well, you will never ever thirst again. And so she left the well and went back into Samaria and was talking about this experience that she had with Jesus. So Jesus went viral. Jesus literally went viral at that time and at that place using the medium of communication which was there, which was what? Word of mouth. Same thing with the man who was possessed with the demons called legions. Nobody could cast those demons out. Nobody. The man was busy mutilating himself. He was so traumatized by the demons. But Christ came and he commanded those demons out of this man. The man wanted to follow Jesus because, wow, who would not want to follow Jesus after that? But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Go back and tell them. Tell them about your encounter. Share your testimony. Jesus went viral. So there was talk of this man who was doing amazing things. And, you know, Apostle Guillermo Maldonado has written a book on deliverance, which is so insightful. And in this book, he talks about how the miracles that Jesus performed were actually very different from the miracles that we find in the Old Testament. 
in the Old Testament, the prophets of old and, and the great patriarchs, the, our Abrahams, our Noahs, our Moses, they performed great wonders. They were able to command the, the universe, the elements, the Red Seas would part. You know, dead bodies would, would resurrect. Yes, they managed to do that. There was provision that was given to the people be, because of their connection with God. But there are five miracles or five acts that Jesus did that were not really recounted in, in the Old Testament. And you can, you can look this up too. Look this up and perhaps it's a study. One was he managed to give sight to the blind. Those who were deaf could now hear. Those who were mute and could not speak could now speak. Those who were lame and could not walk could now walk. And the fifth one, those who were tortured by demons were set free. And what was his message? The message of Christ was, go and tell them that the kingdom of God has come. That is the message. That is the good news. That the kingdom of God God has come. Yes, you have known the prophets. Yes, you have seen and heard of their great works. But the prophets still operated under the law. The prophets still operated in a domain where demons had authority because they had usurped that authority from Adam right in the beginning of Genesis. And so, yes, they performed all these things, but when Jesus came, he was able to speak to those demons. And what do you do if you're a demon and the creator of the heavens and the earth, the man God, says out? You don't have a choice. You literally don't have a choice because if you thought you were somebody, well, here's a wake-up call. Here is somebody who is really somebody. Yes, you have power but you've got no authority. You are not omnipotent. You are not the creator of the heavens and the earth. So when the Lord of Lords and the host of hosts says, bow down, what do you do? You bow down and you go. And those are the five acts and miracles and healings that Jesus performed that were so different from what the Israelites and everybody who was there had ever seen before. You'll remember that when the rabbis heard Jesus speak, they was like, who is this man? He speaks with such authority. That was the differentiator. He spoke with authority because he is authority. He was authority and will always be authority. Hello. And that is what Jesus came to bring back to the earth. He came back to bring the authority that God had given to man back to man. The first Adam made a mess. We feel it every single day. He messed up. And you know, he could have done it differently, actually. Because Eve is the one who said, the snake says. But Adam has the authority could have actually said, no, 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 God said. And so it really didn't have to go down like that. But it did. So Adam's in the house. We see you. Yes, we may come and but be the head and not the tail. Stand and declare the word of God. Where there is weakness, be the strength. Come on, somebody. And so, Jesus came to reinstate that authority. And he gave that authority back to man. And that is the power of the finished work of the cross. That is the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And even when he sent out the disciples and he sent out all his followers, he says, go out into the world, go ye into the nations and make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and cast out every single demon in my name. 
So because of Jesus, demons and Satan who used to have dominion no longer had it because now it was back to us the way that God had originally intended. Because when he created us in Genesis, he says, go and have dominion. But we took our authority and handed it over to Satan when we disobeyed God. But Christ changed the whole script and reestablished the perfect will of God for all of mankind. So that we've got to recognize. And that is the message. That is the message that we ought to be preaching. That is the message that the kingdom of God has come. That is the message that we are no longer slaves to sin. That is the message that we are no longer slaves to drug addiction. That we are no longer slaves to pornography. That we are no longer slaves to any entity. Yes, they may not touch our spirits because that's where the Holy Spirit dwells when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But we know that our bodies and our minds, our souls can be a wreck. They can be a wreck. But they don't have to be. Because we have been given authority to take charge of our bodies and our minds, how we think, the decisions that we make, how we calculate, and what we do. It is about authority, the re-establishment of authority. In Revelation 12, 9, John writes, and, and I'm going to read this. He says, and war broke out in heaven. And Michael, and Michael is the other archangel who was on God's side and was loyal to God. And his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now this that John saw here actually happened before Genesis. It happened before creation. Because by the time God created Adam and Eve, the devil was already there. And the demons were already there. They were already having a field day. And so when Jesus came to reestablish the order of God, the reestablish the order of the kingdom of God, where man now has dominion once again, it was very clear that the status quo had changed. They were there then, and they're still here now. And what do they want? They want dominion. They want territory. That's why it's a war. War is always about territory. War is, war is about overcoming. War is about lording it over. And what are these territories? These territories are our bodies, they're our minds, our souls. And if it is not the Holy Spirit that dwells in these territories, then who does? Because we know that nature does not leave a vacuum. So you're not empty, I'm not empty, nobody is empty. So you've got to choose who and what you decide to be the controller in your life. It's important for us to know the scriptures so accurately that we are able to debunk everything that the devil tells us, everything that the changing world tells us about what's acceptable and not acceptable, about what is human rights and what is not human rights, and it looks like an act of love, but is it really an act of love? In our eyes, is it an act of love because we're working and moving from emotion because we're all human beings and we need to love each other, but what is the definition of love according to the world? What is the definition of love according to God? The line is so fine, the line is so thin that we are called to be vigilant at all times. All times in creating the content that we create, in the messages that we're disseminating to a nation that is hungry, a nation that is bleeding, a nation that is starving, a nation that is looking for answers, a nation that is dying and looking, seeking life. We've got to make sure that it's not about the numbers, that it's not about the ratings and the AR, it's not about the amps, it's not about all of that. Because if we are teaching people and we are giving people 
diluted truths that will fit with a changing world, then we are no longer the salt of the earth. We are salt that has lost its saltiness. We may look like salt, but we've lost all our power because power comes from preaching the word of the kingdom of God. And that doesn't change. There's a place for psychology. There's a taste for motivational speaking. There's a place for all of that. Yes, and it has helped a lot of people and will continue to help a lot of people. But it is only he who has been set free from the sun who is free indeed. Because these things will help you for now. You'll get over it, but then it's going to come back. But the, the type of freedom that we really need is the type of freedom that breaks every chain. The type of freedom that is rooted in the word of God. The type of freedom that is rooted in truth. Not my truth or your truth, but the truth of God. And that truth needs to be delivered in love because God is love. It may hurt you, and it may hurt you not because of how I have said it. It will probably hurt you because, you know, truth does hurt. And it's okay, let it hurt you. But as it hurts you, let's also remind people that God is love. And that beyond this, there's a tomorrow, which is even better than the today that you are experiencing. That when these chains have been set free, you are going to have abundant life. Christ said, I came to give you life and life in abundance. Imagine that. Imagine that. May that be the word that we continue to preach. May that be the message that we continue to disseminate through the airwaves. May we be the change makers because we only preach one thing and that is the kingdom of God. More than anything else, that ought to be our root. The parable of the wheat and the tears tells us what to do in a time where you have not only the world being deceptive, but you find deception even within the church. Where pastors and priests are the very ones who go behind closed doors in dark corridors, invoking powers of the underground in order to be able to do what looks like miracles. And all they're doing is machalai, machalai. You know machalai, machalai? That's all they're doing, machalai, machalai. It looks, it's magic, really. That's what it is. It's, it's magic, but because they call themselves a priest and because they say it's God, you know, people believe that it is God, but it is not, which is why it's important that we need people to understand that it's not the result that matters, but it's the source that matters. Because you can get the results, that's true. We cannot say the devil does not have power because that's a lie. The devil does have power. But what he does not have is authority. He's got the ability to make things look like what they're not. So seek your healing. But seek the healer. So you can get true healing. Not the kind of healing that will last now, but you've made a pact and you've made an oath and you've given your life over to things that you don't even know. And those things bind you in this lifetime and they bind your children and your children's children. And the rest of us in future generations have to be casting and binding things that we know nothing about because of you and your wanting healing. Fine, want the healing, seek the healing, but seek the healer. Seek the healer. We seek the hand of God because we want his blessings, but we ought to be seeking the face of God because we want relationship. We have to seek the countenance of God because we want intimacy. Because he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given unto you. So let's not give people low hanging fruit. You're killing them. You're killing people. That's what we do. Low hanging fruit, quick results. Vending machine, put the money in and it will come out. No, it doesn't work like that. 
and we have been put in positions of influence and positions of power that we can teach the principles of the workings of the kingdom of God and the liberation that comes from the kingdom of God. No easy victories here. No easy victories here. But you know what? You're going to have what we call umpago. You will have uh, food, patkos. You will have supreme help. You will have divine help as you go through the storms of life. They're not going to stop. They're still going to be there. But man, you're going to see yourself going through it like the Red Seas are parting. Because you no longer walk alone. You walk with he whose name is above every other name. And things that were supposed to destroy you, you find them strengthening you. Things that were supposed to finish you, you find them giving you new life and reinvigorating you. And that is where you see the power of God. That is where you see the hand of God, where somebody says, it is impossible. This here could have never happened to me. It is only God that has seen me through. It is only God that has paid my child's school fees. It is only God that has paid my bills. It is only God that has given me this job. It is only God that has given me this healing because everything around me says, no. Everything around me says this is impossible. But surely this must be a living God. This must be a powerful God. This must be a God that is worthy of service. This must be a God that is worthy of an altar that I will kneel down of and benefit before. This is the God that I will serve. And this is the God that I will speak of. He gives you no easy victories. But you know what? He's actually already fought it. There's no battle for you to fight at all. No battle. The battle is already won. It just looks like a battle. It looks like it. <laughs> it's a mirage. You know a mirage when you're walking in, in the desert and it looks like there's water in the distance and you get there and there is no water. It looks like you're fighting, but actually you're not fighting because Christ has already fought for you. So you see, it's rigged. This whole thing is rigged. It's rigged. And the good news is it's rigged to your favor. You cannot lose unless you choose to lose. 